We have neglected defense because we believed, all of us, that we are living in a more serene world, in a sort of a postmodern world. Mm -hmm. And now we are waking up brutally to a new reality. What do we do? Do we give up or we start investing again? Good to see you. Thank you very much indeed for coming in today. I gather that you've been to Northwood. Um, tell us what your trip there showed you about the UK's relationship with NATO. No, UK is a, is a formidable ally and uh, in many respects a founding member of NATO for 75 years. And I think it's in the DNA of the uh, of the British society and uh, the British strategic culture to be an integral part of NATO. Uh, Maritime command, uh, you know, uh, freedom of navigation, undersea critical infrastructures to protect, uh, what we call multi-domain operations, not only land, air, or, or sea, but also cyber and space. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one of the most uh, sophisticated places in NATO, and I'm very happy to see that, like always, NATO is uh, gearing up for a very complex uh, time in world history. And, and you're happy that the UK's got the right kit for NATO's needs, that we're well prepared to meet NATO's aims? Nobody's perfectly uh, prepared, uh, but that's the beauty of this alliance, uh, that we have, I think, in our DNA, a gene for permanent adaptation to a changing environment. That's, I think, the source of our success. So what we are seeing now, we see again war in Europe, unfortunately, continuing, and this will drag on for some time. We see the South, uh, the Middle East, uh, mm -hmm. very close to escalation. We see the, 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 the Houthis, the Red Sea. Yep. We see uh, you know, the Asia Pacific um, becoming more and more complicated. So what the, an alliance like ours does, uh, we adapt and each ally uh, together with us in NATO, uh, they are basically trying to invest in the best uh, possible kit, yeah. uh, which also means money, yeah. but also means uh, an understanding of the environment. Talking of money and the changing environment, Lord Cameron, David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, is, has been meeting with President Trump today. Do you think Donald Trump is a reliable partner for NATO? Lord Cameron was with us at the foreign ministers meeting in Brussels just a few days back, and he made a, there's no NATO secret here, he made an appeal to all his colleagues, uh, the foreign ministers of NATO, to try to speak domestically to the prime ministers, uh, treasury, secretaries, mm -hmm. but also to talk to uh, to Speaker Johnson, speaking of the, the package of support for Ukraine that is uh, now under discussion in the U.S. And I'm very happy that he goes uh, to see uh, the administration, but also uh, former President Trump. We used to work President Trump for four yes. years. Yes. Uh, I remember vividly uh, the meeting we had in London uh, when uh, Boris Johnson was the prime minister and, and President Trump was there. It was a relatively more bumpy start. But in the end, I think everyone understands in America and in Europe that NATO is, is, a, is an indispensable uh, you know, constellation. Of and allies. Trump understands that. I'm, we are convinced that he does. Of, of course, uh, democracy is democracy. We cannot Absolutely. prejudge the outcome of the, of the campaign. But uh, uh, I know that the American uh, establishment and American people, don't forget that almost 70 percent, 70 percent of Americans in the, in, in the last survey, they believe that NATO is a great alliance. Uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, alike, they understand that in a world that China is moving up, that uh, China, Russia, Iran, uh, North Korea are ganging up, you need all your allies around the world. So. We, we, we know that, uh, you know, each, uh, each election has its own uh, specific mm -hmm. issues. Well, you talk about but we, we, we know that in the end, everybody will understand NATO is important to everyone. You talk about adaptation. You talk about democracies, of course, taking their own part. Does NATO have a contingency plan should President Trump, if he's elected, withdraw the U.S. from NATO? Listen, we, uh, we have been uh, doing this for 75 years. And we have been seeing crises in NATO, the Suez Canal, mm -hmm. uh, the Iraq uh, operation, when some allies opposed, you know, uh, you know, ferociously. No one, no one, no one the size of the U.S. has talked about NATO in the way that Trump has talked about NATO, the disparaging way he's talked about NATO, the initial lack of commitment to Article 5. No one's done that. Is NATO prepared to exist without America, potentially? There is absolutely uh, no doubt to my mind um, that America will continue to stay engaged in NATO and European allies and Canada will stay engaged with the US. Uh, that's a matter of strategic uh, reality. In a world so complicated, we need each other more than ever. And I com I'm convinced that in the end, this will be the, the final conclusion of any American president. Clearly, Lord Cameron is there to talk to Trump about aid um, and the aid that isn't currently being approved in Congress. Do you agree with President Zelensky that Ukraine will lose the war if it isn't approved? 
99% of the support given to Ukraine, uh, military, financial, macroeconomic or humanitarian are coming from NATO allies and a few of our partners. So it's clear that uh, our support is decisive. And uh, I think President Zelensky, uh, uh, like always, he's trying to make the best the best case for his country. Is he right, though? I mean, just realistically, I can see why he's making the case. And of course, that's strong rhetoric. But is that re- rhetoric matched by the reality? I think, uh, in a way, it's against our interest as NATO and, and NATO allies individually uh, not to continue to support Ukraine. Let me answer in, in this way. Why? Because Ukrainians, in a way, are fighting our fight. And why? Because if, God forbid, uh, Ukraine fails to resist as an independent sovereign country, the imperial appetite of Russia to go even further Ukraine will be only encouraged. And also the example to other uh, superpowers would also be Mm -hmm. emboldened. So we believe that it's our interest and our moral and legal obligation to help Ukraine. I know that this this support will continue. So he's right. We know that without us will be uh, far more difficult for them. They are a formidable force. They have uh, a fantastic capacity to resist. But it's clear that without our support, their struggle will become uh, more difficult. What does winning against Russia mean for NATO? It's what up is for the Ukrainians to decide. Uh, it's, it's not for us to decide instead of them. I think it will be, will be something which is against the character. So if they of negotiate a, a path to so peace that they might see the Donbass they will, or they will, Crimea go they, they to will Russia. Des- they will decide, yeah. uh, and only them will decide, when the time is ripe and on, under which conditions uh, peace could be achieved. You, and also, let's make, make, make be at, attentive to one thing. Russia uh, is not to be trusted that even if they will eventually talk about peace, they will not mean peace. They will just mean a truce, rearming and eventually coming coming back. So that's very important for us to making sure that Ukraine gets closer to NATO, gets closer to the EU, because in the end, that's the Accepted ultimate issue. into NATO. That's no question to us that they will become a member of NATO. I don't. I cannot say when. But the question of if, I think, has been addressed. And I think all allies understand that one day, and we hope uh, the sooner the better, Ukraine will become part of NATO, part of the EU. All this rhetoric of being in a pre-war period, not a post-war period, I'll put it to you that no one in Britain is is really worried about war coming here. It all feels very, very far away. What is it that What is it that those people aren't getting? I think there is an understanding, uh, even for the general public and even for politicians, that the definition of security these days is multifaceted. It's not just military per se. I visited uh, Marcom in, in Northwood. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have established a special uh, unit there, a center, for protecting critical undersea infrastructure. Imagine one second, one second, that the undersea cable connecting New York to London as the two financial cities, uh, places of the world, where 90 something percent of global transactions are happening every millisecond, that they will be eventually cut by one of the nations that are not our friends. What would that mean? Would mean, you know, a massive disruption. So when we say we cannot say it's pre-war or post-war, we know one thing: it's post-Cold War, mm-hmm. and it's also a part of great, uh, great power competition. Maybe and and, and in Poland, word. probably it's perceived, or the Baltic countries yeah. or Romania, differently than in London. But I think we all understand it's a dangerous world. It, maybe war's the wrong word. Maybe we're in a, we're in constant conflict. Is that what we're in? We're in a, a world where these undersea cables or the satellites above our heads or, or even cyber space, or cyber or disinformation. We are constantly look at the Chinese attack against yeah. the institution of democracy in your great nation of, of the United Kingdom. So we are basically in an era of great power competition where our security is challenged every single day in more traditional forms and in more non-traditional forms across Europe. You talk about Poland. Countries have been reintroducing forms of conscription. Uh, The head of the army here, the former head of MI6, former deputy prime minister, says that the UK needs to prepare for a form of conscription. Given the threats you just talked about, do you agree? Listen, uh, NATO is not a one-size-fits-all. There are history, there's legacy, there's uh, strategic culture, that's economic, economic and democratic realities in each country. Uh, Poland has introduced a system close to the National Guard that mm-hmm. Americans have. The Finns, uh, our our recent new allies, uh, have a form of very interesting semi-conscription, if I can call that. Uh, other countries are just uh, mobilizing reservists. So it's not for us to tell uh, which uh, shape and form. But we say one thing. This is what we request from the UK. 
that will request from Finland. And if that country uh, is fulfilling, uh, you know, uh, the targets that we're establishing for each ally, we are fine with the solution adopted democratically by But each of the allies. I, I put that into the context of what NATO has been saying. Uh, look at the comments of Admiral Rob Bauer says NATO countries must prepare for a conflict with Russia. This constant drumbeat of we are in pre-war, not post-war, and yet NATO is sort of slightly ambivalent about what countries do to mobilize the population to that effort. That doesn't seem like the rhetoric is meeting reality again. No. Now, let me tell you like this. The best uh, defense is deterrence, like in, you know, like, like in football. <laughs> the best defense is offense. Mm -hmm. uh, we are now undertaking and implementing the most robust transformation of defense planning, defense planning, troops, command and control, forces, structure of forces uh, in, in a generation. So what we are just expecting from each ally, from the UK to Poland, from Romania to the US, is to really start implementing and execute those plans. If we do those plans, will be such an, Im an important deterrence to Russia to think of attacking a, an ally that to, this will be the most, the, the, the the UK, most powerful thing. We've got a, a military that just about fits into Wembley Stadium. We, we, we don't have the boots on the ground that NATO might need if we're going into apparent... All, all of us in Europe, with a, with a slight exception of America, probably, uh, we all have collected what we call the dividends of peace. We have neglected defense because we believed, all of us, that we are living in a more serene world, in a sort of a postmodern world. Mm -hmm. And now we are waking up brutally to a new reality. What do we do? Do we give up or we start investing again? But does that new reality mean that people with the kind of skills a state would require if the undersea cables got cut or the satellites got took out would be needed to help the state or NATO broadly in making that work again or in protecting that or in advancing the interest of those It's working interests. progress. I have to say I'm personally amazed, personally, and, and as NATO leaders together with Jens Stoltenberg, to see the rapidity of adjustment of our allies to this new reality. It takes time. It takes money. It's not easy. There are lots of reflexes that mm. probably have been a little bit, if not lost. It takes an argument. It takes it, persuasion. And this is, the, this is, and we should not basically uh, use only the argument of, of, of fear, of conflict. And by the way, also Russia is suffering a lot. They lost 350,000 uh, uh, troops in this war. Even if the war economy seems to be working uh, relatively fine, the rest of the economy is suffering a lot. So we, the more we do the job we need to be doing to make sure that our security is protected. And I think every single citizen of this alliance in the UK or in any other country, they do understand that without peace and security, there is no business, there yeah, is no life. You, you, and this is something I believe we have to continue convincing people, people in this country about the idea of conscription brought up in, in many different ways, in whatever form that would take. And people go, nah, no way. I'm not, I'm not standing up to fight. That's the military's job. What do you say to them? We are just saying that uh, societal resilience, as we call it, is important. And some countries choose conscription, others don't. I think all of us have an obligation to be ready to work with difficult situations. Yesterday it was a pandemic. Uh, tomorrow could be, God forbid, something from climate change. Uh, the next day could be something close to a war, not a war. So I think what we have to tell our citizens is, listen, there is a more dangerous world. We are not asking things that are not acceptable to you because you know, democracy doesn't work. But we have to understand that the world is more dangerous and we have to be prepared as a society to withstand these challenges. And I think this is something that resonates that with people. But what does that mean? I, I, what, what am I meant to do? Am I meant to stockpile food? Am I meant to build a bunker? What no, am I meant to do? No, but in, 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 I think in all of our countries, uh, there is, you know, uh, a beginning... Uh, Of a, if you want, of a, of a, of a con continuum between traditional military and non-military means. So in order to have a more resilient energy system is part of defense. If you have a smarter grid, if you have stronger cyber defenses, if you have stronger space capabilities, civilian and military, they all contribute to our security. And I think this is what un our people uh, do have understand. Have we forgotten that? Have we spent 20 years, 30 years forgetting that? I think we, it was a sort of a, uh, it was an illusion uh, that history uh, eventually never stops. Uh, there's no, no such thing at end of history. Uh, competition uh, uh, among uh, 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 nations is, is part of human history. With w what we are now witnessing is probably the most complicated moment of transformation in human history because you have the technological revolution, 
uh, and you have also the the strategic uh, uh, revolution. And this is something that we have all of us to be prepared for. I'll put it to you finally then, that with everything going on in the world um, and with the difficulties that there are presented, but the, what some people might see is the mismatch between a reality that doesn't seem to affect them and the rhetoric that they hear coming from NATO, coming from politicians, is that NATO's sabre-rattling. NATO expanded east. NATO's been putting bases where the Russians said they didn't want bases. This is in part NATO's doing. Listen, I'm a Romanian, and I lived half of my life in, in communism. And I really urge anyone else who has not lived under communism not to try it. So if a country like Poland or Romania, after years of communism and Soviet domination and, and gulags and everything we see still continuing in Russia, if we wanted to join the free world, is us to be blamed or Russia for trying to keep spheres of influence in Europe? Uh, 75 years ago, we just celebrated our 50, 75th anniversary. There are only 12 allies in the West. Now there are 32. Why do you think that Sweden, for two centuries, neutral, two centuries, or Finland, uh, neutral since the Second World War, they decided to join this great alliance? Because Russia is dangerous and unpredictable. And I think NATO is the place where you can have your safety, your security, your daily life, your concerns addressed better together than, than alone. So Russia, unfortunately, seems that their instincts of imperial conquest and obsession with territory acquisition and grabbing is not disappearing. What have I to do? I'm really sorry that Russia has chosen that, that, that path. But if they've chosen that path, I have the obligation to defend my people, be they from northward uh, or from Bucharest, my, my, my city. So let's have trust in this alliance because we are just think the world is not easy, but together in NATO we are much stronger and much safer than being alone. Great to meet you. Thank you very much, Steve, for coming in. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for that.